Um, I, we think it is. We actually don't even know. Uh, <laughs> we're learning new technology. But uh, I mean, it's not, oh, Jason's watching it. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll be starting in just a minute. So we allegedly will be starting in just a minute. But um, today I'm talking about um, developing people skills. And I, I think that if you, if you can learn how to win with people, you can do anything in the world. I mean, every job. I, I know so many people that are like really high producers in so many different fields from construction to technology, you know, faith-based, churches, and it's so many different places. And everybody has to do well with people. Um, I, I, I don't care if um, I don't care if, if you're like working in the public. I'm looking over here at Shannon. And, you know, he's a police officer. Detective, whatever, I don't get the terminology wrong, but uh, <laughs> don't shoot them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, there's a different way to interact with a, you know, when you had to pull over or, but within the organization, if you don't work well with people, you're just not going to be successful. I don't care what your job, what your skill set, where you are, it's not just a, like, nice job. Like, you, you can't say, well, you know, I, I don't work in a nice field like a church, so it's different. But it really is. People are the same everywhere. And if you don't know how to interact well with people, you're not going to rise in the organization. And most of all, whatever it is that is in your heart uh, that God put there, it's not going to be accomplished. So uh, I've got some good uh, teaching material here I want to talk about. But I want to pause and let you comment, ask questions, or give your input. And, uh, and I also want you to, um, I also want you to, to be able to ask questions and, and let's just talk about how to do a better job with people, all right? So um, we'll start right here. Uh, Samuel Johnson says, he who waits to do a great deal of good at once will never do anything. I put that in there because I want you to be proactive about uh, how, how you can be better. You know, make, make a decision that I'm going to be better at leading people. I want to accomplish something great. We're going to talk about how you can't get there by yourself. So um, a, a lot of this material, by the way, came from a book by John Maxwell. It's one of the, his older books. It's been around a long time called Winning with People. And I, I would encourage you, if this kind of stuff gets your attention, grab that book. It's a really small, like 100 pages. It's really small. Um, it's got a lot of great advice. All right, so first of all, you'll start with yourself. You can't be a winner can't win with people if you're a loser, right? Touch your neighbor and say, don't be a loser. <laughs> That's, yeah. So um, you got to start there. You got to make sure that, that, that you're a winner. And um, step one is to recognize your own value. Actually, I was going to, I need someone to loan me uh, the largest bill in your pocket right now. Can you trust me? The largest bill, what you got? All right, oh. all right. here we go. Uh, all right, Hop is, uh, he's, he's carrying around, good deal. So Hop's carrying around $20 bills. That's exciting if anybody needs any gas money. All right, so I got a $20 bill here. Everybody knows what that's worth, right? It's worth $20 or, you know, maybe, maybe lunch at Applebee's or whatever. Uh, first of all, by show of hands, if I were giving away Chris's twenty dollars, anybody would take it. Anybody take the twenty? Okay, most most people. Now watch this. Watch this, Chris. Don't get mad. All right, watch this. I've just really mauled this twenty dollar bill. It's just like, it's just a mess. Would anybody still take the twenty dollar? Really? You you even if I tore it in half, would would somebody take it? If, Really? Why is that? Didn't lose any of its value. And so that's the truth. Thank you, Hop. That's the truth about your life, right? If you have been ripped to shreds, you don't need to be like, well, I can't lead people. I can't accomplish something great. I can't, you know, get this promotion that's available. You shouldn't be thinking that. Just because something's gone wrong in your life, you need to start with valuing yourself and recognize that what happens to you does not decrease your value. Even mistakes you've made, it, it might slow down your progress. It might, it might 
make things a little bit more difficult for you, but it doesn't decrease your value. So that's step one, recognize your value. Step two is to increase. So you want to recognize, but you want to increase your value. And, and, and the only way to do that is to deal with your own issues. If you know that you have anger issues, listen, you put on this earth to do something. You want to accomplish something great. You can't accomplish it by yourself. You got to have other people. So you got to interact well with people. And if when things go wrong, you just get mad and mean and just terrible, well, you need to increase your value. You're more valuable to the organization, to the calling of God on your life if you'll fix your issues. Hey, if you're lazy, if you just don't get to a meeting on time or to work on time, you need to fix that. You just you need to fix whatever is wrong. If you don't trust people, you're just not a trusting person. Somebody hurts you so long ago, you can't remember when it was. But you can't trust in anybody else. Talk to somebody not long ago. They don't go to church, or they didn't uh, a couple weeks ago. And they're telling me about something that happened in another state years ago. And I'm like, come on, you, you got something to accomplish. Don't you need God and God's presence and God's people in your life to accomplish something? Well, get over it, you know. So if the first step is to recognize your value, the second step is to increase your value. You know, don't, don't just settle that, well, you know, my dad, he always lost his temper, and that's just what we do. We lose our temper. Come on, don't believe that. Get better at it. You know, if, you, if, if, if you're terrible uh, in, in a certain task, make up your mind you're going to get better at that. 45% of Americans say they would change a bad habit if they could. Well, you can. You can. You all know the old uh, the little story that uh, if you go to a uh, if you go to a, a great circus, you know you'll see these huge elephants being held in the ground with a tiny wooden peg, and you know why that works is because when they were babies they they uh, tied them to that peg and they pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and as a baby they couldn't move that peg and so they were convinced they can't move the peg. Now they're a you know multi thousand pound beast of strength. They could kick that thing out with a, you know, their little toe, if they have toes, whatever they have. They could move it easily. <laughs> but they're convinced, hey, I, I'm, I'm tethered to this, and I can't move it. And, and I think a lot of us, we do that too. We're just, I'm tethered to my past. I'm tethered to my family heritage. I'm tethered to how I was raised. But you need to increase your own value by dealing with your own issues. The Bible says you are more than a conqueror, so go conquer something. I mean, it would be awesome if today... You wrote down what your issues were. Like right now, this, I need to get past this. And just go conquer it. Because in the end of the day, you're going to do something great. You're going to have to do it with other people. And I'm just not going to be on your team if you are snarky and if you've got anger issues or if you're passive aggressive and one day you're nice to me and the next day you're talking about me. I'm just not going to be on your team. And if you try to do it by yourself, you see that phrase right there. We, we love this old African proverb so much we hung it over the door. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I feel like that if you're going to do something great, you've got to get other people on board. Nobody's going to go with you if you don't deal with your issues. So uh, step three, believe in your value. So you, you have some value, and, and you need to believe in that fact. So um, there's a story uh, you may have heard of. Uh, everybody's seen the Rocky movie, right? Uh, actually, not everybody. We did Rocky. Did, did we did that this year and at the movies or? Creed, yeah. We did Creed, yeah. Somebody was like, so there was movie? Who was like, they didn't even know that the Rocky movies had happened. But most people in the world, you know, know about the Rocky movies. Well, the first Rocky movie was written about a guy named Chuck Wepner, real dude, who fought toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He was a nobody, pulled up out of just low-class uh, boxing to fight this champion, and he went toe-to-toe -to -toe for 12 rounds, uh, law, or 15 rounds, lost the fight, just like the, the movie. And Rocky, Sylvester Stallone, he wanted to be a filmmaker. He wanted to be a great actor and a filmmaker, so he decided he's taking this guy's story. And so uh, when, when he wrote the story and wrote the script, some, some bigger name people wanted the script. They offered Rocky, uh, they offered, I keep calling him, they offered Sylvester Stallone $400,000. Uh, but, but he wouldn't be in the movie. We'll just buy the script from you, $400,000. Y'all, that's a long time ago. It's the 70s. That's before Sylvester Stallone is sly. He's not rich. He doesn't have a ton of money. Actually, 
um, he he actually only had a weekly salary to, to do that movie of three hundred and forty dollars a week. Turns down four hundred grand, but he believed in himself. He's like, I can be the best Rocky there is, and so he believed in himself. And I I can't calculate how much money he's made. You know, eighty. 80 Rocky movies, it seems like. <laughs> so the other guy, on the other hand, Wepner, the guy, it was his life story. So Sly offered him 1% of the total revenue uh, over the long period of time or a one-time lump sum of $70,000. What do you think he took? He, he took the $70,000. And um, it cost him, right after the whole, I don't even know, like, Today, because it gets replayed and there's more and more money made, but right after the initial movie, it, it cost him $8 million. And uh, Chuck Wepner today is a liquor salesman. That's his job. He's a liquor salesman. He could be a multimillionaire. But he didn't think enough of his life story. He didn't think it was important enough to really bet on himself. He bet on $70,000. And, and see, that's what happens when you sell yourself short. So I would really... I'd encourage you to think about your own value, your own strength, and ask yourself, what is it that undermines that strength? I want to win with people. I want people to be on my team. I want people to have confidence in me. Well, I got to, I got to work on me. I got to make sure me is a better version of me. So that, that's where it starts, is, is you value and build your own value as you move on. Now, uh, big point number two is, is really... I think maybe the best part of what we're teaching on, practice the 30-second rule, 30-second rule. And that's within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, you're going to encourage the other person. I, I don't think many people practice this rule. I want you to think right now, it's, it's, it's noon today as we film this, it's, it's noon on a Wednesday. How many interactions have you had today? And how many times have you intentionally encouraged somebody today? So, uh, I mean, I, I don't always do that. Sometimes I focus on it, but I don't always do that. We got in here today trying to figure out how to use this little camera, and I, I'm, I'm monkeying around with it, and I look over, and here's Joey. I'm like, Joey knows all that stuff. I didn't encourage Joey. I didn't give him 30 seconds of praise. I threw my iPhone at him and said, make this thing work, Joey. <laughs> That's not great leadership. I'm paying it back now. I'm talking about how great Joey is. Uh, but great leadership is investing in a person and, and just recognizing that everybody's in a battle, right? I hope we've all gotten to that place. At least we all realize that. You're not the only one. When you're younger and you don't know a lot of uh, people's personal stories, you, you think it's that you're the only one going through a lot of junk. But you get a little older, you interact with people, you get to know people's stories. Hopefully all of us, by the time we're right here today, we all know everybody in this room has a battle going on. You don't know what my battle is because we're just not that close that I'm personally unloading on you. And I don't know yours, but I've got a battle. And, and, and so wouldn't I feel better if you, know, you told me something great about me? <laughs> I'm, going to I'm going to fight that battle. And if I felt better about me, I'm going to do a better job fighting that battle. And see, when most people meet another person, they think of a way to make themselves look good. Right? That's our first thought. We smile. Not because, you know, I'm wanting to make you smile, but I don't want to, you know, I just look better when I smile. You know? <laughs> and even if I smile, if it's lunch, I'm like, I'm thinking about me, right? It's just natural to make myself look good. And, and a lot of times when we're having conversations, if you don't really know them, you're not in a deep conversation, but you're just kind of chit-chatting with somebody, you're, you're not even listening to what they're saying. You're thinking about what you need to say next that makes you sound good. And the way you can test yourself on this is when you meet somebody and they go, hi, I'm whatever, and they tell you their name, and you respond, how often do you right then forget their name? <laughs> not all the time. They just told you their name, but you were thinking about presenting yourself well. You want to look better. Now, again, that goes back to point number one. Do you believe in yourself? If you really believe in yourself, you're not worried about, oh, did I dress right? Am I, looking, am I out of the right place? Am I, am I saying this well? Is my, you feel, you're confident in yourself. You feel like, hey, I'm a good person. This, this guy, he's going to like me. He's, we're going to have a good interaction. And so I can really focus on that person. 
uh, and interact with them and, and, and really lift them up. But the 30 second rule is the opposite of that, <laughs> that idea that, you know, I'm just going to make myself look good. And that's what real charisma is. You know, charisma, pe people think charisma is that guy who just, you know, when he, when he enters the room, you know, he just, he just takes over a room. He, he's just the center of attention. He, he's, he's bigger than life. It's what I would call showmanship. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's different than charisma. Charisma is from an ancient uh, Greek and derived out of a Latin word, char uh, charismata, and it means grace gifts. Think about that. Charisma is grace gifts. When we say, man, he sure does have a lot of charisma, well, what did he give you? Did he give you anything? See, because real charisma is about lifting up somebody else. You know, uh, a person who is selfish, kind of focused on himself, comes in the room and makes himself look good. He's making a presentation. A person who really thinks about you, he pours into you and he makes you feel better. That's what the definition of charisma is. So if you're going to win with people, you do that. Now, the 30-second rule, I think I wrote this in your notes, 30-second rule gives triple A treatment. And that is <laughs> attention, affirmation, and appreciation. Uh, so um, let's just look for just a minute. Let's, let's say... Um, Najee's looking at me. He's talking to me. You ever had anybody do this, Najee? You talking? They're talking to you, and you're going. They're going. Yeah. Yeah. What What does that say to you when somebody does that? They're not. They're not fully engaged. Yeah. What is that? So why would they not be fully engaged? Because you got to think about that, right? Either you're not saying yeah. Something else going on, or so. So, so the first, your first response was, he thinks what I'm saying is not important. Yeah. That's not how you build friends, <laughs> teamwork, camaraderie, unity, all the things that builds a great team. So you gotta, you got to focus right in on him. This is one of the um, tasks that I've worked hard at. I mean, just really worked hard, especially like at a, at a church service uh, on the weekends. There's like people moving everywhere. And sometimes like I'm looking at you, and there's literally some dude behind you going, hey, hey, Pastor Jay, how you doing? Because there's this thing about people that wants the preacher to know they were at church today. You know, I, hey, you know and then they're out, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm like, I'm going to look at Najee and ignore that crazy dude back there. What, that's hard to do, you know. So my, some people are just naturally good with this. Derek Dale, Kip Potter, this stuff comes natural to them. They just make you feel good. And, but most people have to work at it. And I'm one of those people, I have to really think about, am I giving them my attention? All right, so that's it. First of all, focus on attention. Triple A, attention. Secondly, it's affirmation. To affirm somebody is to tell them something good about them. Let's take a practice right now. Everybody choose a partner. Everybody choose a partner. Look at them. Affirm them. Just one of you is number one and the other one's number two. Affirm them. Tell them something great about themselves. All right, that should be enough. Listen, I've seen all you guys. You're not that awesome. That's enough affirmation. Okay, <laughs> okay so you know what that's like, right? It's to say something about them that lifts them up. I appreciate how you do this. I, your heart for that, you know, this, that's good. <laughs> Is that what Joey told you? You have great hair. Oh, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a, a moment, you know, just a, he was put on the moment, on the spot, right? So attention, affirmation. The third one is appreciation. Now that's a little bit different. It's kind of, it's affirming, but it's a little bit different when you say, uh, like I might look over to Chris and say, man, I appreciate how that when I need you, you drop everything. I know you're busy, you got stuff going on, but man, there's never been one time when I said, could you help me with this? That you went, I, I could, what, what, what do you need? He's never said that one time. He's always like, what I need to do. So that's, that's affirming, but it's specific. And so it can't be considered fake. If, if it's specific, you know, you can, you can fake stuff. You can make up stuff. You can say junk. That doesn't matter. But if you go to the, to, to the effort of affirming them with a pre specific appreciation, something they have done, um, that, that, that does something powerful. Then, then the 30-second rule gives energy. 
a psychiatrist named Henry Goddard conducted a study on energy levels in children, and he used an instrument called an ergograph, and the findings were fascinating. He discovered that when tired children were given a word of praise or condemnation, the ergograph showed an immediate upward surge of energy. And when the children were criticized, the ergograph <laughs> showed physical energy took a nosedive. So when somebody praises you, you, you phys there's a physical response. That's, isn't that amazing? Like God, the sim I was about to use a big word that I don't know if it's real or not. <laughs> Symbiosis. That doesn't sound real, does it? There's a sim something powerful. A symbiotic relationship. Man, I, you should have told me that before. If I had just rolled that out without any help, that would have been <laughs> so cool. I really appreciate how you helped me with my words. <laughs> There's a symbiotic relationship between how you, how you feel and physically how strong you are. I, it might, I, I, when I look at that, the Creator must have wanted us to encourage each other. It's like a little shot of adrenaline, you know? It's like a little something there. He must have wanted us to encourage each other. So it literally surges your energy, and when you're criticized, it literally makes you feel bland. It, it li literally happens. So imagine an atmosphere around you, on your team, where everybody was surging. <coughs> how, how cool would that be? Everybody just like Or an atmosphere where everybody's worn out. I mean, I watch a lot of football. I've seen that, where a team that has, they got the momentum, they're excited, they're scoring, they have been conditioned really well, and in the fourth quarter, they got their hands up, they're looking for the fourth quarter. They know that other team has not been conditioned well, and you can see it, man. You'll, you'll have a team that maybe has the lead for three quarters, and that last quarter, man, they're out of energy, and the other team's been rotating in, and they're fresh, and they just run over them. You get a chance for your team to be that <coughs> losing team or that winning team by the way you talk to people. So you want to you wanna lift them up. So Ben Franklin said this. Um, he said, hereafter, this is a little bit King James Version sounding, but listen closely. Hereafter, if you should observe an occasion to give your officers and friends a little more praise than is their due, and confess more fault than you can justly, you personally can be justly charged with, you'll only become the, the sooner for it a great captain. Criticizing and censoring almost everyone you have to do with will diminish friends, increase enemies, and hurt your efforts. So practical <laughs> actions you can take is focus not on how you look, but on how other people feel. Think triple A. Attention. Focus on people. Affirming. Say something good about them. And then, and then appreciation. Say something specific about them. William King said gossip is, a gossip is one who talks to you about other people. A bore is one who talks to you about himself. And a brilliant conversationalist is one who talks to you about you. Somebody tell me somebody you know that does that really well. Anybody? Derek Dale. I was about to say Nikki Dale. <laughs> Julie? Julie Hall. Yeah, what's that like? You work with her, right? Yes. So what's that like? Very uplifting. And how can you... How can you tell it's genuine? How do you know she didn't read this book and just like she's just using this book to... How can you tell? Yeah. You can feel it is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the ways I can tell Julie's uh, really genuine is her eyebrows rise when she's like... When she's, she just leans in. I mean, she's not like... So you did a good job on that match. She's like, that was awesome. The eyebrows. Yeah, that is true. Have you noticed that about Julie? She like leans in and she's like, that was so cool. Go you, Julie. <laughs> Is somebody else? Do you work with somebody? You know somebody that's really good? Roger Ham. Roger and Sabrina Ham. They are the two of them doing the people in the life that have 
being uplifting me and encouraging me and being attentive. And they're always telling me how I can do better and what I'm doing is good. Yeah. You know, when you're here, you, yes, you're doing a great job, but, you know, you can, you can, you can sell it even more. So, so that, that actually... Uh, a little bit deeper into the notes speaks to something. So let's go there. Uh, number three is let people know you need them. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau said, the greatest compliment was ever paid to me was when someone asked me what I thought and attended to my answer. That, was, <laughs> that assumes that you can be asked what you think and they don't even care. Um, what, what would you call that? that? That's playing the crowd or that's manipulating. Wouldn't you call that manipulation? So, yeah, so, 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 what, so what, uh, what do you think about that? And they're not even looking. They're looking at what they're going to say next. They're, you know, it's, it's kind of manipulation. He says, a great compliment is when you listen to my answer. Great leaders stumble. This is straight out of John Maxwell. Great leaders stumble when they, think, when they begin to think that people need them. Leaders only become great when they realize it is they who need people. That's a really good contrast. Great leaders stumble when they think the people need them. And you never become a great leader until you realize that you need the people. You saying something? Oh, okay. Um, so all leaders need people. John Maxwell says, any dream you can achieve without the help of others is far too small a dream. So when the vision's bigger than you, you have two choices, give up or get help. And if you, like, if you don't, uh, if you don't have confidence in the people around you, if you don't have a, a high view of them, you, you look down on them, it, it's going to translate. You, you can't fake this stuff. You can't go read this book and just determine, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to uh, get people to do what I want them to do because I, I'm going to learn this like going to class, learning how to do this. I, I don't think you can get there. I, certainly there are great uh, manipulators. Who, who can accomplish things. But to, to really accomplish a movement that makes a difference in the world, it has to be something in your heart. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson said, we should, only, we should not only use all the brains we have, but all that we can borrow. So people need to be needed. Um, people need to know that they are needed. Every individual's fate is tied to that of many others. John Maxwell says, we, can't, we cannot be like the shipwrecked man who sits at the end of a lifeboat uh, going nowhere while everyone in the other uh, bails furiously because there's a hole and he goes, that hole is not on my end of the boat. You can't be that guy. If you think you're going somewhere and they're not, none of us is going anywhere. Right? So you, you got to know that you're in that with people and people know they're needed. Warren Dennis said, good leaders make people feel that they're at the very heart of things, not on the periphery. People need to know that they made a contribution, that the contribution was significant, and that you recognize that contribution. It's a weak leader who thinks he can do it without other people. I mean, you're not even a leader at all if you're doing it all. I'm just a doer. You're just a really good doer. And you're doing a lot of things, and that's admirable in its own right. But if you're just a doer, when you stop, it stops. I mean, I want to... I wanna, know that the influence I had on this earth outlasts me. But if my whole influence is like, if I were to say, well, I'm a, I'm a good preacher, I'm just going to get bigger and bigger crowds to listen to me preach, and that's my whole influence, what happens when I die? Or get in jobs? <laughs> what if I can't preach anymore, you know? And that, I was never a leader. I was just a doer. But if I inspire, if I train, if I equip, if I motivate, if I lead, up other people, then what I do gets bigger. You know, my granddad was a leader. He didn't even pastor his own church. He was a preacher, and he was an unbelievable motivator. And he has 13 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who are preachers and pastors of churches. His, his leadership goes on. He was a trucker who preached on the weekends at a tiny little church in Abbeville, Alabama. His doing, I don't know that it left a great mark on the world, but his leading was incredible. He thought I was the greatest everything ever. And then when he died, I heard my cousins tell that uh, they thought he thought 
they were the greatest. Like, <laughs> whack out. He didn't even like you, bro. <laughs> and we all came to the same conclusion that he was a leader. He was just leading people. He never, he, he never graduated sixth grade, y'all. He did in the sixth grade. But he has left a legacy that is reaching in multiple states around the world um, because he encouraged people. He lifted people up. So swallow the prideful thought. Here are action items. Swallow that prideful thought that you can do it alone. Think about how you can help other people reach their goals and how that's going to help you reach your goals. And sincerely ask for input from other people. Uh, let's talk about compliments and um, criticism. Anybody ever been criticized in public? How did it make you feel? Yeah. Um, immature leaders do that a lot. I, I've done it before. It's been a long time. Um, sometimes a person can force your hand and make you correct them in public, and that's difficult. You know, if you, you're a member of the team and you do something that's just, just obviously terrible and in front of everyone else and for the good of the whole team, I need to deal with it, then that's difficult for me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to put you through that. But for the good of the whole team, they have to know that, you know, we're taking care of that. There's only been a few occasions in my leadership that I felt like that was necessary. But most of the time, you want to correct people in secret, but you want to praise them openly. We also say uh, at our staff here at Daystar, we say we want to send praise down and send complaints up. Now, that is the opposite, the exact opposite of what is natural and safe. It is really, really natural for, um, for you to come over here, for Stephanie to come over and go, hey, that was a great leadership lesson. You did awesome in that. And um, then to walk out and go, you know, that was kind of okay, but he went long and, you know, I don't know if I'm coming back next week or not because I got things to be at. But the better way to do that, the correct way to do that would be to come to me and say, hey, I like that content, but it kind of went long and I felt weird about stepping out early. Is it always going to go long like that? and then walk out the door and brag like crazy to everybody else about how awesome it was. That's the way you're supposed to do it. That is counterintuitive to the way it normally happens. Because every generation rebels against uh, whatever is seen as the, um, the organized system. Every generation always has. People making a big deal about millennials today rebelling against organized whatever else. Every generation does that. And then all of a sudden, the millennials are going to wake up one day and go, crap, we're the organization. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> we can't nobody rebel against anymore. Who's these jokers rebelling against us? <laughs> That's just the way it happens. I, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. We rebelled against uh, you know, boomers and those old people. Now we are the old people. That's just how it happens. So, uh, but great leaders <laughs> come to a point where they recognize that you build consensus and you build teams by encouraging in public and then you deal with problems up the chain. I love it. Like, I'm at a restaurant the other day eating, um, eating uh, seafood. Man, I love, love, love seafood. One of my biggest sacrifices before God, my greatest ministry sacrifices, has been living in a town where they don't cook good seafood. I, I'm sorry. You go to a, a North Alabama seafood restaurant and they're frying catfish. That ain't seafood, y'all. That's... That's river food, you know? <laughs> Seafood is like, man, you know, it, it's, it's tuna and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's yeah, red snapper and bull reds and it's a crab stack with soft shell. I'll see y'all later. I got to go. <laughs> no, there's nowhere to go, you know? So I'm at a rest, seafood restaurant in, in Birmingham and they got a chain down in, uh, they're out of a chain out of Mobile. I've eaten that many times and they're just burning the fish. You need, if you're cooking fish, you need to start with the realization that fish can be eaten raw. It's fine raw. When I go fishing, red snapper fishing, we'll cut one open and just take a bite out of it right out of the Gulf of Mexico. I can do that all day. It's called sushi, y'all. So don't overcook my snapper. I mean, somebody went way out into the Gulf, caught that fish, brought it in, put it on a truck, 
drove it all the way up to Fultondale, brought it into y'all's restaurant. I dropped 40 bucks for it, and you burned it. <laughs> you kidding me? All that effort to make me feel good, and now you ruined it. So I filled out a nice, well-documented, complete comment card with some advice on how to correct the problem. Whole time I'm filling it out, my wife Leslie's going, don't turn that in, don't do that, don't say that. I said, honey, I believe in this restaurant too much. I have too much confidence in their ability to get it right to walk out of this place without filling out the comment card. Now, you guys, um, I mean, honestly, there was a little bit of frustration in me. It wasn't all I was trying to bless them. But I, I really think that's the best way to do it. I think it's a whole lot. I would much rather... If you came to into my church and didn't enjoy the weekend experience, I would love it for you to tell me why. Don't just walk out the door and never come back. Even if you're not going to come back, tell me why you didn't come back. That would be awesome. But, but, but people don't do that. That's just not natural to people. It's, 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 um, it's confrontational and people don't like to confront. So what that means is if you're going to be a leader and you, and you know that your life's blood is to be able to get... Uh, feedback from, from people that you're trying to reach, you have to be amazingly good at receiving criticism. Really, really good. Which, by the way, most people are not. Most people are very defensive about receiving criticism. You know, if I, if I were to uh, walk over to Stephanie and say, Stephanie, you handled that meeting really well. I appreciated several things about that meeting, but you know, this right here, I think could have been better. Naturally, is going to be to go, well, I had asked somebody else to do that anyways, and they had and just go right into excuses as, as opposed to saying, hey, thanks for being honest with me about that. I, I kind of felt the same way, and that, that helped me. We'll, we'll be better at that. And that makes me feel like she really wanted to hear it, and, and, and it makes me want to tell her again next time so that it can get better, you know? And so you gotta, you got to be really good at receiving criticism so that you can get the next criticism. But if you like to hide and run in a hole and cry... <laughs> Because somebody criticized you, man, you, you're not going to have the moral fortitude to be able to be a great leader. Let me pause for a minute. I went off script and just talked a while. Somebody tell me what you think about how you criticize, how do you receive criticism, any thoughts that uh, you have from this. I know that statistics say that people are seven times more likely to share negative information, any, a negative experience. Outside, right? Yeah, the wrong way. Yeah. So I think that... I mean, that just proves your point about it being natural. Um, but that just, that proves your point about <laughs> it being natural for you to share. Uh, yeah. You just want to share negative things. And then as far as, um, I think we, I may have said this a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if it was this group or not, but like, uh, if someone says something in a public setting without confronting me first, my initial response is to just get really irritated. I mean, I can't even, I don't even yeah. hear what you're saying anymore yeah. because I feel disrespected. I feel like I was never given the opportunity to possibly explain. Fix it or fix it, explain. explain why. There might be a reason that you don't know about. You know, you never know yeah. what it is. So um, if someone says something in a public setting and never says anything, and, and I know we shouldn't hold grudges, but it, it's hard to not, you kind of lose trust in that working relationship because then you feel like yeah. that person is against me or I can't, you know, and then you've got to build that back up. It's just, it creates a bunch of issues instead of so just I, going I, to the person. Uh, you bring up some really good points about when, when um, and I know Facebook Live can't hear you, so I'm going to try to restate a little bit of this, uh, how when somebody calls you out in public when they haven't talked to you personally, that's really difficult. And the word, the magic word you said there was trust. So like we have a lot of meetings uh, where uh, we, we call out issues that went wrong on the weekend. But there has to be a trust environment because like it would, it would slow productivity to a crawl. If like when I make notes, if I found seven things that we are opportunities for improvement and, uh, but I was afraid before I went in here, I need to email all seven people, tell them what I thought and, do the sandwich method, you know, tell them how good it was and, you know, it could have been a little bit better here, but overall it was amazing. And then they got to come back and give me all their back. And then we come in here and we finally have a meeting about it. Well, that, that just kills productivity. So there's got to be a middle ground, right? And so within a, 
a circle of people who have real trust. You don't have trust by accident. We have focused on trust that you can trust that I have your best intentions at heart and that I know you're, uh, you're, you're do- and one of my talks I'm going to do is um, uh, your expectations versus uh, your experience and the gap between those. You know, it, life is perfect when I expect this and I get this. That's called perfection. Like the Walgreens commercial, we don't live anywhere near perfection, though, right? So what, what do you do when there's a gap between what you expected and what you experienced? Trust has to come in there. That's where trust comes in. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that maybe in a couple of weeks. But if you don't have a trust culture, you're just dropping bombs on each other. You know, and, and you know, you're like, well, you know, y'all didn't get the lower thirds right on that so-and-so deal. And, and that's what, you know, maybe somebody from worship told you that. And you're like, well, I wasn't going to say nothing, but the mix sucked too. And, well, while you're bringing it up, let me just go on and tell you that there was a misprint in the worship guide. And, it, well, let me just go ahead and say this. Those clothes you wore look like you got them out of a dumpster this weekend. And that's not, uh, that's all that happened this weekend, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. But that's not a trust environment, you know. But a trust environment is where, where you work at it. There's a tremendous book by um, uh, Patrick Lencioni called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And um, I may, if we have enough time, I might hit that one week too and just show you an overview of those five dysfunctions. But one of them, the central one, is lack of trust. You, we don't trust each other. So we can't, we can't give constructive criticisms or opportunities to enhance because we don't trust. He's out to make me look bad. Or she thinks, you know, I don't know what I'm doing in my job. And so all that really begins with trust. Um, let me get back a little bit to the, to the outline. People want to feel worthwhile. Um, Mary Kay Ash. I don't know who that is. I wonder if that's Mary Kay. Does anybody know if that's Mary Kay, like the makeup person? Okay. Awesome leader. Mary Kay Ash is an awesome leader. Built a great brand, a great organization. She says, everyone has an invisible sign hanging from his neck, and it says, make me feel important. Everyone does. Everyone. When I think about that, I, everyone, I think about your dad. Does Lance Self really have a sign that says make me feel important? Because I've noticed that because Lance is so, he's an engineer and he's so straightforward, Kip's mean to him. <laughs> like Kip is nice to everybody on the planet. But when he sees Lance, he just, rawr, rawr, rawr. he just gives it to him. <laughs> and, 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 and I just wonder if Lance... I just, I just not, I'm not teaching y'all. I'm just thinking out loud. Does, does everybody have a sign on that says, make me feel important? Do y'all, do y'all agree with her statement? I mean, she's Mary Kay. She's pretty smart. I mean, you work with some rough guys. Rough, what do you think? Yeah, I think in the place need affirmation is thankful. Yeah. I see it more than a lot of people. They walk in and it's just a trip. Yeah. For us, it's a trip. We're really thankful. Yeah. So maybe respected. You could almost like in change those words. To feel respected, yeah. Yeah. I feel like anytime you do anything that makes someone feel disrespected, but everybody wants to be respected. Right. So I think that brings up a point that you you can't judge like just by because a person like Lance, who's an engineer type, type A, is kind of direct, that he's a machine. He's just a machine. You have to treat everybody with respect and, and everybody the same. Um, compliments affirm people and make them strong. And when you affirm a person for a positive trait, he becomes aware of it and more consistent in it. That's what makes you a powerful leader. If I, if I point out something that you're great at, you become aware of it, because it might be natural for you, but you become aware of it that it's a strength and you focus on it more, and that even gets better. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. So don't ever overlook it. I've been guilty of that before. I've been guilty sometimes, a long time ago, in my early leadership days, I treated people the way I wanted to be treated. Now, see, we tell people to do that, don't we? Treat people the way you would like to be treated. And we know the golden rule is, let's all say it together, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so that kind of, that was kind of my calling card for, you know, I'm always like, 
we scored a touchdown. Okay, let's score again. I, I didn't really want to spike the ball and cheer and run around and high-five everybody in the stands. I want to go score a touchdown. Why, why it took three plays? Y'all can't score in two plays? Come on, let's get better, y'all. That's kind of my mentality. And so I didn't take a lot of time to celebrate the wins. But I think, it, obviously, the golden rule is true. Jesus said it. So, But how would you have people do unto you? That doesn't mean do exactly to them what you want them to do to you. But I think more it is I would want people to look at me as an individual and, and gauge what it is that motivates me and what it is that I like and try to provide that. And I want to do that same thing. I was just doing what, and a lot of preachers do that. You ever, you ever been, heard a preacher preach? And like, he, he is really exciting himself. He, he's getting very excited about what he's saying, but it doesn't seem like anybody else is. That, that's a preacher disease. Y'all, I consult preachers, and I tell them about that all the time. Don't go, you need to go to God's Word just like that. Define what motivates and excites you. That's called your daily devotional. Don't take your daily devotional to the pulpit. Go to the pulpit with, with a focus on the people, knowing they're at a different place. You, they didn't go to seminary, all right? They don't really want to know a whole lot of Greek today and a whole lot of, you know, they don't even know a bunch of that stuff. Tell people what speaks to right where they are. And that's true in any communication, any kind of leadership. Is think about what it is that they need. When you brag on a positive characteristic in a person, you make it stronger. When you affirm a person's dream, their dream becomes real and attainable. Every time somebody comes up with this dream, I'm going to do this great thing. I'm going to accomplish something great. There's a little, even no matter how strong you are in that, there's a little bit of, if you're honest with yourself, if you've ever talked about a dream or a vision you had, no matter how strong you promoted it, if you're honest, there's a little bit of doubt in you. Can I really do that? Are they sitting out there going, who does that joker think he is? You don't really know. And when somebody comes along and says, Chris Hopper, you are going to graduate from Bible school and be a great minister. You, wow. Wow, I'm going to do that. Because, you know, Chris Hopper waited until he got clean from his addiction and he was well, he's a grown man well into, you know, his 30s and now he's going to go back to college and be in ministry and really... Those are the thoughts, am I right, Chris? Those are the thoughts in your head. But when first day you're in this room, the very first day you're in this room, what did I do? I called on Chris to stand and lead the prayer the first day in this room. I never saw sweat develop so fast in my life. I mean, he went from a normal person to a cold sweat pouring water off the side of his head. Uh, but, you know, when you affirm somebody, it, 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 it tells them that that dream is real. And public compliments are the greatest compliment you can. George Adams says, I don't care how great, how famous, or successful a man or woman may be, each hungers for applause. Encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Good work can never be expected from a worker without encouragement. No one can ever have lived without it. And if you think about it, guys, even Jesus... What did God the Father say when Jesus was baptized? Do you remember? Who said? Uh, what did you say? This is my son. In life. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You mean to tell me the Son of God needed public encouragement? Yes. So everybody does. Um, so I'm going to wrap up Facebook Live. It's been awesome to see you guys. We'll do it next time. Actually, I may not. This may be on while I go to the bathroom later because I don't even know how to turn it off. <laughs> jo Joey, <laughs> bye. This has been awesome, guys. It's been fun. For the last five minutes, I'm just going to let you